Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Area K conference call. Today is Tuesday, the 23rd of April. So you're all very welcome. And I believe maybe Father Jar might lead us in a, in a brief prayer to begin. Would that be okay, Father? We'll pause for a moment in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So in this quiet moment, we gather and we ask the Lord to bless all of our most special needs and intentions, all of our greatest worries and troubles, we place all these in his hands right now. We pray for all whom we know who are unwell. Whatever age, we think particularly, of course, of infants who are ill and whom we ask God's blessing on right now. We pray for all those people in our lives whom we know need our prayers, whom we might be worried about. Dear God in heaven, I pledge my allegiance to you. I give you my life, my work, and my heart. In turn, give me the grace of obeying your every direction to the fullest possible extent. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So back to you, James. Wonderful. Thank you, Father. That was wonderful. So if Greg is there to do a lovely reading for us. Yes, we have today's oh. reading is from the book Staying in Place from the section of The Mind of God. If we are going to embrace life in the mind of God, then we must be mature thinkers. While it is important that someone teach us to think maturely and model this for us, it is also important that we are disciplined in our thoughts in order to impact our words and actions rightly. Random thoughts, often intrusive and disturbing and erupting from wounds, do not represent God if they are immature, frightened, or angry. Random thoughts that are spiteful should set off loud alarm bells. We have dealt with righteous anger and suffice to say that it has to do with how others are being mistreated and not how we are disrespected or underappreciated. Again, that's from the book Staying in Place in the section The Mind of God. Good to be here with you. Thank you, Greg. Um, I thought today, um I I thought today we would just explore a little bit of our thinking and how it needs to be. And I love that reading from Serving in Clarity because those readings really direct us into the the living out the living out of our faith the concepts of you know like detachment and um as opposed to indifference um and i think there can be a real objectification within our membership about other people who perhaps aren't practicing that's that's for each of us to examine and say, where am I located in terms of the people who aren't actively pursuing the sacramental life? Where, where am I located in relation to them? And it should be sitting next to them because we're all at varying levels of compliance. And, and you and I know that at times in our lives when we would have been, um, <clears throat> let's say, the the letter of the law, we might not have, we've been, might have been struggling with the spirit of the law. And I know for all of us, as we advanced into our, our relationship with Christ, you know, that spirit of the law begins to bubble up in us. And we begin to say, this is interesting. Um, I understand that Christ in the New Testament came to heal the sick. And he came to um, connect with sinners and and bring them along. And so that's where that spirit of the law begins to get exciting, you know, and it, be, it brings life to the letter of the law. It animates it. It animates it for us. And our teachings then become not that criminal code or, you know, um, the list of rules at the skating rink, but the teachings become 
more like the bumpers in a bowling alley intended to keep you aimed at your objective and out of um, injury and harm. And you know, when we go over those bumpers, um, we don't just divert from our objective, we also hurt other people, don't we? Sometimes ruin their lives, literally. And so for that reason, uh, our teachings are safety, not just for us, but for the people around us. And I, I'm excited about so much of this um, bringing alive the spirit of the law into the letter of the law and identifying for us all that we need both and that we are attempting in this apostolate to bring ourselves into better line with both. Perhaps one is diff more difficult for us than another. We can understand rules and regs, but the spirit lets us down in relation to other people, maybe. So um, that is why in this apostolate, we're, you know, pursuing actively our objective of greater holiness. Now, I how many here had occasion to take a look at the document we sent out recently? The thoughts on, okay, good. Then you, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, what I... Uh, wanted to do there was help us understand as lay people that clericalism is a big problem that has to be um, wrestled to the, the mat for the sake of the priesthood. Yes, but for the sake of the church and for the sake of the lay people, because when we talk about this, I, I even saw myself in the document at one point, yeah, this happens. And then this happens, this, and what is the impact on the lay person experiencing it? And we've all got stories. You all have stories and they're in my head. And this document is, at one point I asked a friend, what do I do with all these stories about things that have happened to lay people because of clericalism? And um, it's tough, you know, because I love the priests around me and I am surrounded by wonderful men. And yet a problem that threatens the membership of our faith has to be acknowledged, you know? When I'm not here to become popular, I don't care. Um, and holy priests need this exposed as much as any one of us. Okay, so it's important that you and I become accustomed to saying, I don't think so, Father, if something happens that makes us uncomfortable in the confessional. Or if you get a 30-minute homily that's ranting with a priest that's shouting, keep your demons. Okay, that's a freak out. Who goes to mass for that? Or someone who is publicly shaming someone from the pulpit or inappropriate in the confessional, wants to know too much about a sexual sin. I mean, I'm not going to list these. And I have said, do I write these? Is this a negative exercise? But then what was pointed out to me was the document you just received. Well, that's what I do with those stories. So that's what I've done with them. Now, I think that I see uh, the... Um, Renewal coming to life, taking on life, taking on light, and taking on momentum as we challenge those two areas. The idea that anyone on this call or anywhere else on the planet can determine who's in a state of mortal sin needs to become passe. You can't judge. I can't judge. We've been instructed by Christ himself not to do this. The idea that... Actions by themselves constitute automatic mortal sins. It's not true. Simply not true. It depends on everything else. A full analysis has to take place. The most full analysis available is available to Jesus Christ, whom the Father said, 
was the judge. Okay, so we don't have any questions about this. This is rooted deeply within our tradition. Uh, the latest beautiful document, the Declaration Dignitas Infinita, deals with um, uh, these issues that threaten the dignity of the person, which is what it's about, my friends. It's about us being dignified and being able to protect our dignity and feel our dignity and also to be acutely sensitive and protective to the dignity of other people. Okay, this document says, um, and it deals with these and many other issues that threaten the dignity of the person. This declaration draws upon the teachings of the Second Vatican Council, which emphasize that all offenses against life itself, such as murder and genocide, abortion, euthanasia, willful suicide, must be recognized as contrary to human dignity, but also all violations of the integrity of the human person, such as mutilation, physical, mental torture, undue psychological pressures. Um, also discussed is human trafficking, which is taking on tragic dimensions uh, and is described as vile activity, a disgrace to our societies that claim to be civilized. The declaration invites exploiters and clients to make a serious examine of con examination of conscience. And I was happy to see that they identified the marketing of human organs, which is very, you know, I want to say prominent in Europe, but I'm sure it's everywhere. Um and including exploitation of boys and girls, slave labor, prostitution, drug and weapons, trade terrorism, and international organized crime, something the Holy Father has gone after. Okay, now interesting that the language used is inviting people who traffic and use traffic people to examine their conscience. It's not saying you can't receive communion. It doesn't say that. It says, we are inviting you to a serious examination of your conscience. Well, my friends, if human trafficking and those who purchase people are being invited to a serious examination of conscience, maybe we could extend that same benefit to people in irregular, what we call irregular unions, as opposed to explaining that they're in a fixed state of mortal danger and peril because they have tried to heal from a relationship and moved into another one. Every other area of the best science and human studies available would call that healing. I mean, you heard me say this before, but like we, we, we really, you and I at least, can adjust our thinking. And when you and I adjust our thinking, the way we talk to and treat other people, maybe suffering in circumstances like this will change. And what changes if that changes? Well, their experience of Catholicism changes because you and I are the front porch. And if they have a conversation and an interaction with someone sitting on the front porch and it feels okay, well, maybe they'll take a couple steps further and actually come into the church itself. And what will they do from there? Well, Christ is there in the tabernacle. And maybe they'll feel the magnetic draw that he sends and they can connect directly to him. So that is important to us. I, I just want to get clear. I hope I'm not doing this to death for you guys. I really hope I'm not, but I want to be crystal clear that sin is sin. And I'm not saying that the mistakes we make with malice and intent don't elevate to the level of sin. I'm not giving anyone a pass because you know your conscience is not going to give you a pass. You know what I mean? So we're not doing that. What we're doing is something different. We're saying, hold your position of direct relationship with God. Our job as Catholics is to help invite and protect other people's direct relationships to God and to assure them it's always there for you. It's always there for you. No one can take that away from you. That's our job as Catholics, to invite people to sit in front of the tabernacle and let God go after their life with a fork and untie the knots. Um, okay, so in terms of our teachings, we're trying to, to talk about what's damaging to people. What could hurt you? What could threaten your peace? Um, what could interfere with your ability to positively impact the people around you? 
and that, you know, um, there's so, in terms of the sexual sins, marital chastity is the highest, you know, goal. And I, I assure you that most marriages have never heard of it. So when you say the most serious sins are reserved for people in irregular unions, I would challenge that. I would have to challenge that and say, oh, no, not so fast. Any uh, situation where people can be objectified, depersonalized in use uh, in intimate re relationships, whether they're married or not, um, using porn in, in, in a marriage, just, you know, where are we going with that, anyone? We're not going anywhere good. Uh, the what the, the uh, what someone says is problems with sex is never about sex. It's always pointing to something different. So you can use it as a symptom of something in the relationship that requires a tweak or whatever it is. But you you're not really um, wouldn't be advisable to go into areas that we consider. Uh, sinful or deviations of holiness to fix a surface problem that's really deeper. Um, I think with people, what they're missing is 15 years of formation. Like people are formed through grammar school and then it's over in a lot of situations. A lot of people can't afford Catholic high schools. And in a, a lot of Catholic high schools, the formation isn't really what we want. Isn't that true? Okay. So we have to do our own. As a Christian community and assembly, we're going to have to take responsibility for forming people or accept that they don't know anything really much about their faith as adults. Because what you get as children is excellent priming, but then you've got to be formed again. We actually started a program where um, designed for all of us, I hope, but that'll make us be excited about our faith, of course, but also for people coming back in to say, to simplify matters and to start with what needs, to begin at the beginning with, you know, the Nicene Creed. Um, I think it will be good because it won't make people feel that they're inadequate. It will make them feel that they are part of us and hopefully excite them. The other thing in terms of discernment about actions is, you know, to which will be part of this is how do you feel after an action? You feel spiritual energetic? Do you feel um, peaceful? Or do you feel uncomfortable, unsure? Um, feel a little bit of like, oh, am I a good person or a bad person? You know, that uncertainty towards yourself. So the discernment around actions, I think will help us all to like two baby steps on what is actually, uh, what is actually a problem for us. You know, we're living in a culture, well, I'm, I, won't, uh, I won't get on it, but um, there's some really twisted stuff going on within relationships, but um, sexuality is seeking connection. And if you can recognize that when you're being tempted sexually or there's difficulties there, what you actually need is connection, human connection. Um, it will put it in perspective for you and take the weirdness out of it. There's a lot of what can go on in it where it's like certain things are wrong. They're just not wrong because we're Catholic. They're just flat wrong. You know, so it's not the church that's hindering us from doing things. It's our conscience. Our conscience is talking to us and telling us this is wrong. Um, it's not about the church becoming liberal. I mean, your conscience is going to still be activated, whether what whatever happens with our teachings, mine's not going to change. If tomorrow morning we woke up and the Catholic teachings all changed, I would be doing the same thing the day after because I have an interior sense of what protects my dignity in Christ and what Christ needs from me in relation to myself, to my spouse, to my children, to you. You see, so let's not, I, like, I don't, I think what Christ needs is he wants you to come closer to him all the time. Also, um, Bring people to his love for them. 
his hope for them, his, you know, his, he's got a plan for them wherever they are in whatever situation they're in. There is a beautiful pathway to dignity for them with Christ. That's not too hard. It's not going to be more than they can handle at all. And I think the problem with returning people is we make it more than they can handle by assuming that they have to go from mile marker 20 to mile marker 64 without traveling the stretch of the road in between. For them, it's going to be a journey. Some people have helicopters. Some people don't. And they got to walk the road. Christ would be so happy with us and what we're doing and our apostolate and our real sincere desire to preach him and let him be the savior. Let him be the judge. Let the good ideas come from him. You know, if we pray, they will. I think he'd be so pleased. I think he is so pleased with us and where we're going. And if you're going to read that Dignitas Infinita, 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 Dara, Infinita, Dara probably doesn't know either. Um, you're going to like it. You're going to like it. And something else I'm I'm delving into is Benedict these days. Pope Benedict, it's Deus Caritas S. I loved it when it came out and I'm madly in love with it now. He's like, God is love. Religion is love. This is what it is. So let's stop tripping over our foot, our foot faults. Like in basketball, if all you can worry about is your feet, you're not playing the game. And people are looking at it like they're not, they're not good at this. They can't, all they care about is their feet. No, no, no. Like, you've got the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Christ did not die on the cross for you because you were never going to sin. That's not why he did it. He did it because you were going to experience your human nature, your fallen nature. And he did it because he wanted you to feel great about yourself, even in those moments where you had to repent, you had to put your hand up, you had to recognize you could have offered something better. That is why he died for us so that we would have that, that confidence that, you know, imperfect people need a perfect Jesus Christ. And we have them. My friends, I can promise you, I see renewal happening. I see it. I see the light. I see the wriggling. I see people like, I could do that. I want to come back. I'm ready. Tell me what to do. How can I help? You know what really helped a lot was the um, uh, the invitation booklet. That created a lot of open openings for apostles, and it created a lot of energy. We can send one of those testimonies out or a couple or something. So we need to get 20,000 more of those booklets printed and distribute them. And see, that's what interests us. Fundraising seems boring compared to that, but we're going to uh, ask the Lord to anoint all of our work and let it be his. Okay, everybody. I love you all very much. Again, God loves us. He loves this apostolate. He loves what we're doing. And it shows because it's it's growing and there's a ton of energy around it. So God bless you. I'm happy to see your beautiful faces. And we'll talk to you again. Bye. Bye-bye.